How many of you have been in a really stressful situation and you've struggled to stay calm and focused? Can you try and get back to that place? Maybe it was a car accident or a fight with someone you love or maybe a really big exam at school. Let's go there. That feeling in your chest and the way your brain doesn't work quite right. Are you with me? Okay. There are millions of kids like this. They feel like that every single day. These kids live in poverty, and with poverty comes trauma, and trauma creates stress, and stress means your brain doesn't work quite right. These kids go to school, and they feel like you felt in your stressful event, and they try to learn, but often they can't. And all the foreign aid money that goes into building schools and providing education for these kids, it may not help them. There are millions of other kids in the world who also feel like this. 10% of children in many industrialized countries, they're diagnosed with ADHD or anxiety. These kids are stressed out and they have a hard time learning. People who feel like this, adults, children, they are everywhere. Maybe one of them is sitting right beside you. Or maybe you live with one of them. Or maybe you are one of them. This little boy was one. He's my son. I'd like to share with you something that we did that helped these kids learn how to calm down and focus. And it involved a pinwheel like this one. Let's check in. How are you all feeling? Are you calm and focused? If you are, let's go back to that stressful event. <laughs> Try and remember, in the middle of it, your chest, the way all that adrenaline is rushing and your head is so fuzzy. Can you get there? Got it? Okay. Now, I want you to imagine you're holding a pinwheel like this one. Everyone, arm up. You can close your eyes if it makes you more comfortable. What I want you to do is take a deep breath and blow on the pinwheel and imagine it spins. Here we go. And again, I want you to take a deep breath and blow and imagine it spins. One more time, blow, it spins. Now, how do you feel? Any better? If you do, you used your body to change or regulate your brain state. You did something we call self-regulation. Maybe you regulated your feelings a little bit, calm down, after I stressed you out. Maybe you regulated your thoughts a little. You focused on the pinwheel and your breathing instead of the car accident. For many people, self-regulation is really difficult, and here's why. Self-regulation requires that we use our prefrontal cortex. That's the rational part of our brain here. It deals with attention and organization and planning. It has to regulate our amygdala here. These are our alarm centers. This is like anxiety and fear. The part of the brain that keeps us alive, it's pretty hard to override. Self-regulation is tough on a good day. For children, it's even harder. The development of children's prefrontal cortices happens slowly. For a child, it won't be fully functional until they're 25 years old. And this explains everything about my teenager's behavior. Kids that have suffered trauma or have challenges with attention and anxiety, the development of their prefrontal cortex is either different or delayed. So these kids are not yet good at overriding these big emotions like anxiety. And they're not very good at focusing their attention yet. But the good news is, just like we can train our bodies, we can train our brains. But the bad news is, teaching young kids to do this, it's really hard. Self-regulation is invisible, and it's just not in the curriculum for most schools. I think that for many of these kids, teaching them to self-regulate is more important than teaching them to read and write if we want these kids to get an education. We developed a brain computer application to help children learn to self-regulate. Like many innovative projects, this one started with a complete coincidence and me taking a leap. It started when I'd been asked to do a design workshop with young children at a computer conference in Nepal. 
I'd never been to Asia, never worked with young children in a different culture. I didn't speak Nepali, but I took that leap and I got on a plane and I found myself on the way to Kathmandu. But that's not the leap, it got worse. So after the conference, I decided to go on vacation. I went to an uh, ecotourism town called Pokhara. It's incredibly beautiful. It sits at the foothills of the Himalayas, and it's also impoverished. Nepal is one of the poorest countries in the world. And there, I met a friend of a friend for lunch. Her name is Leslie Cheswick, and she's a trauma therapist. She volunteers for an organization called Nepal House Society. They run this amazing therapeutic school for kids living in poverty, young girls. They've done some incredible work there. These kids, even though they may not look like it, these kids have suffered more trauma than most of you can even imagine. Nepal was at civil war for a while. Some of these kids have seen their parents or their relatives shot right in front of them. Many of them have suffered sexual abuse. These are little girls. They're malnourished, and most of them are beaten repeatedly. All of that trauma, it shuts down the development of their prefrontal cortex. So the kids were healing, and they were learning at the school, but it was slow and hard work. And as I listened to Leslie talk about these kids, I started to get stressed. My amygdala started firing. I felt so anxious. And not because I could imagine what these kids had been through, but because of my own son. I have a son who was so stressed out at school that he couldn't learn. And I knew, and I know, what it feels like to sit outside a grade one classroom every day and wonder how many minutes are going to go by before he comes out of that classroom in tears or in anger and says, take me home, I'm done. Every day, my son went to elementary school. I felt like I was trying to save his self-esteem. I was fighting to create a positive future for him. Empathy is an amazing force because my prefrontal cortex thought I was on vacation, but instead what happened is I said to Leslie, I want to help. With my son, we'd used different kinds of things to help him learn to self-regulate. It was a process, but one of the things that was really successful were some simple biofeedback games. I'd found a game where he had to calm himself down. He had to control his heart rate to make these blue dancers slow down in their dance, and he got really good at that. I realized how powerful these tools were. It was late one night. He'd just had a horrible day at school. This is a really bright kid, so his mind it's going round and round. I cannot get him to sleep. He's overtired. And I said to him, do you remember what it felt like in your body when you slowed down the blue dancers? Can we give that a try? Sure, Mom. He was asleep in minutes. At eight years old, he had learned to self-regulate without the computer application. And so as Leslie was talking about these little girls at the school, I had this crazy idea, and I wondered, like, could I design a brain-computer system for these kids that might work? I knew I couldn't use heart rate. It's not very reliable, and when kids are moving around, it doesn't work. These kids can't sit still. But we now have a technology that can measure brain waves. For $99, we can get a headset that looks like this one. And it can tell us if a child is calm, or anxious, and it can tell us if a child is focused or distracted. And we wrote a program so it could send that information to a tablet, like an iPad, and the iPad can display that information about what's going on in the child's brain. This kind of system is called a brain-computer application. And when we can see what's happening in our brains, it's called neurofeedback. If we want to learn to self-regulate, it turns out neurofeedback is a really great way to do it. It's like having a coach right inside your head. And the coach says, yeah, that's right, you're doing it right, or nope, not quite, try this. So as I talked these ideas over with Leslie, she was incredibly positive about it. So I went home to Canada, and I pulled together some funding, and a small group of students that I handpicked from Simon Fraser University, and we built the first version of Mindful. The system is a brain-computer application. That means the tablet is controlled by your brainwaves, uses neurofeedback. 
runs on an Android tablet. It's portable, it's solar powered. And it was built for children who had never used a computer, who had not yet learned to read or write, who didn't speak English, who had developmental delays and behavioral challenges. It was an easy design problem to solve. <laughs> it was the first of its kind. There are two main ideas that were really important as we created Mindful. So the first was that I needed to forget everything I had learned designing software for children over the last 20 years. Seriously. Leslie gave me a book, and it was called Crazy Like Us. And it talked about how people come to a new culture, and they want to help, and they bring all their assumptions about what's going to help this group of people. And they're almost always wrong, because cultures are different. And I saw an example of this at the school when they gave me a tour through. So there was a sand tray like this. And it's used for play therapy. And the idea is that the kids take the little animals and they talk about what's happened to them and they act out the trauma. And it's a healing process, except for it wasn't working at all. In Nepal, cows have these big ferocious horns. They're sacred in Hindu culture, which means they're not always penned in. They wander through the streets, and it's a little scary for me, let alone these little kids. Dogs roam in feral packs and bite children. And to the south, there's a jungle that still has tigers in it. So for these kids, animals are not safe. And they hadn't grown up on Disney, so animals definitely don't talk. <laughs> I took this picture to remind myself, in Nepal, cows don't talk. They just walk into people's houses. <laughs> Instead of relying on my assumptions about what might work or might not work, Leslie and I spent a great deal of time with the kids. We tried to understand their world. I took pictures, I took photographs, I brought all that home with me. And it was critical for me to be able to create neural feedback games for these kids that they would understand that was based on things that were familiar in their world. So that was the first really important thing. The second important thing was my solution to the problem of how am I going to teach these kids how to self-regulate? No idea. And then I had a moment when I realized that all children already know how to be relaxed and focus their attention. This little boy, when he blows on the pinwheel, just like you just did, he calms his body and he focuses his attention on the pinwheel. I just had to figure out how to get kids to practice this repeatedly over and over and over again so it would get easier for them, maybe semi-automated a little bit. And so when they were in a stressful situation or they were in a noisy classroom, they would be able to self-regulate better. This is how mindful works. We tell the child what they need to do. We play an animation on the tablet. And this one, it shows the girl. She's blowing on the pinwheel. The pinwheel spins. The girl leaves the screen and leaves the pinwheel behind, and it's the child's turn. They blow on the pinwheel on the tablet. Their body shifts a little bit. They calm down. Their brain waves follow. The headset picks that up, and it sends it to the tablet, and a program we wrote makes the pinwheel spin. Each time they can do this for a short period of time, they earn a token. The jar stores tokens, just like it stores rice in their houses where they live. Repetitive practice is key, so you need to collect tokens. There's a series of games. In another one, you have to stay calm for a longer period of time to land this paraglider. This is a really familiar sight to these kids. They live in an ecotourism hub where trekkers wait for their tours and paraglide down. It's really relaxing watching them. OK, we're going to see how this works. Levi, it is no small thing to be calm on this stage, but what we're going to see is Levi demonstrate the paraglider game. There's one token. Let's see if he can do it again. Well done, thank you. Mindful is a series of games. They all use neural feedback. 
and they're all based on activities that are familiar to these kids. They make invisible brain processes visible in ways that kids can understand. Two years later, we went back to Nepal to test it out. We ran a field study at the school with 22 little girls over three months. First, Leslie went ahead. She taught some of the counselors how to use the system, and they taught each other. My son, Levi, came with me, and he taught the kids how to use the system. We split the kids into two equivalent groups, and the counselors worked individually with the first group, practicing over six weeks, and then the second group. We assessed all of the children before we started the study, how, uh, their ability to calm down, pay attention, all of the children after the first group went, and all of the children after the second group went. And here's what we found out. All of the kids improved their ability to self-regulate in a variety of situations, on the playground, in the classroom, when there was something disruptive. And they also uh, got better at paying attention. So it worked. I was totally stunned. I actually never thought the project would work. So it was fantastic. But there was something even better, and I'll show you. This little line here. So the ki kids in group one got better doing mindful, and then these kids got better doing mindful. These kids weren't using mindful anymore. And when we assessed them at the end, they continued to improve. Remember my son at bedtime? These kids learned how to self-regulate in six weeks, and they could do it without the app in their classroom. This is really important, because it means that one tablet and headset can help an entire school of kids. We have now built two more versions of Mindful for completely different groups of kids. And if we see this kind of positive result continue, I'll feel more confident that we can help lots of kids. There are over one billion children that live in poverty. For not much more than the cost of an iPad, we can have Mindful in every school. Imagine how much more effective foreign aid could be if these schools also taught children how to self-regulate. Imagine if every child who struggled with anxiety and attention in our schools here had a chance to get better at self-regulating. Imagine the kinds of adults these kids could grow into. I actually have a really good idea about that because I know one of them. Now, I want you, all of you, to imagine what your life could be like if you got better at self-regulating. Thank you. <laughs>